so my vision kind of medium term is to create a studio environment that truly does not put a ceiling on the talent of emerging professionals. Episode 118. This is the business of architecture. Welcome back, Architect Nation. This is the show where you'll discover tips, strategies, and secrets for running a profitable and impactful architecture practice. If you believe that it's possible to make money and do good, then this is the show for you. If you aren't already on the Business of Architecture email list, make sure you claim your free account on businessofarchitecture.com by clicking the green Join Today button. I'm your host, Enix Sears. Today's show is sponsored by BQE Software, the makers of ArchiOffice. ArchiOffice is the office and project management software built with the needs of architects in mind. And for a limited time, startup firms can get two free seats of ArchiOffice for a year. Go check it out at ArchiOffice.com. Today, we're joined by Anthony Laney, AIA. He's one of the co-founders of Laney LA, which is a husband and wife team with a focus on local architecture and digital design. This episode is going to be very interesting to you if you're planning on starting your own design firm anytime in the future. Also, if you're starting your own firm, you'll find it very interesting. Anthony's going to share some of the most important lessons that he's learned over the past two years of launching his modern design firm in Los Angeles. And I'm sure a lot of you who went down that road many, many years ago will find this interesting to hear perhaps how times have changed since you started your firm or perhaps how things are the same. And at the very least, maybe give you an insight into what some of these new designers coming out of school, the way they're approaching their practices. So let's get on with the show. Here's a question. Tell our listeners, just give them a little bit of a background about your firm so they can have some context. Sure. Um, our firm is Laney LA. Um, my wife and I are partners in the firm. We have experience in uh, custom residential design. And so about 18 months ago, we decided to officially team up um, and move out of our full-time jobs. And we launched our own studio. And we knew right away that we wanted to grow it using the virtual studio model. So we started teaming up with friends and colleagues and we operate um, in Los Angeles and tackle a variety of very local projects. About 60% of our work is residential. The rest is a mix of light commercial and uh, landscape design. And I think the thing that it all has in common is um, they're very much um, within arm's reach of where we live and work, so very local projects. Tell me about the first or the last year that you were working for a previous firm, right before you launched your new firm. What was going on that year in your mind as you were contemplating? I want to kind of figure out what made you want to jump out on your own. Yeah, um, I, I, had, um, I have tremendous amount of respect for all the firms that I've worked for, especially the most recent one. Uh, it was a small to medium-sized firm that did a variety of work, um, custom residential as well as um, big multifamily projects. Um, the my fifth year there um, was was still doing great, but I I had something in my blood that just told me that I wanted to um, be able to grow more in the strategy department, more in the vision department. I wanted to be able to steer the front end of the premises behind the projects, and so um, I enjoyed being a project manager. I enjoyed the design exercises that came across my desk, but I. I knew that the way that I was wired, I wanted to move upstream in terms of just having the conversations that framed the very, the very premises of project. And um, to my knowledge, those are you know the, the jobs that owners do. And um, so the, in, we spent about a year planning and eventually negotiated a contract with my employer where I could work as a consultant to help them train um, replacements. Um, I didn't want to leave on, on bad terms. And so we had a transition period. And I had a business coach who strongly recommended that I do that, where um, I negotiate from a W-2 to a 1099. And I provide uh, my former employer with um, hourly services. That was a benefit to them. That was a benefit to me. It was a win-win, which is what we're always shooting for. 
And then we, over the course of six months, transitioned that down to where I was um, no longer providing them with hourly services. We still have a great relationship. And um, then we're full time on our on our own projects. So you've been doing that for about eighteen months. During that time, have you discovered anything about yourself? Are you? Do you feel like you're an entrepreneur at heart? Very much. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yes i i love um, I love being able to craft the foundation and assumptions behind a project because often uh, our clients are either first time. Um, new home builders or first time remodelers or it's their first time remodeling their business. And so I think that they're very much open to hearing um, someone think with them outside the box in terms of what the process should be like. And um, I, I just, I love and thrive um, being included in those high level conversations. And then I, um, um, maybe it's because I was a TA when I was a student, but I just, I really do enjoy the satisfaction I get from working with a team where we can kind of cultivate the talents, the emerging talents of, of other individuals. And um, so that, that's provided a lot of satisfaction. Anthony, do you ever worry that you'll get pigeonholed in residential design? I, I don't, no. No, our, our relationships, I feel like our number one asset is the way that our clients and our consultants recommend us. And so they when they look at us, I know that they don't, they don't see somebody who says, who, they, they're not thinking to themselves, oh, here's a guy who can do a house. They're thinking, here's a guy who understands how to manage a design process. And so we, one of our best moves has been to not insist on being the prime agreement. And what that means is, to me is, um, rather than just saying, hey, I want to be the dude who designs this house, we've started to team up with a lot of builders, contractors, developers, real estate agents, and say, hey, let us help you in these projects you already have. It might be a small portion of scope, but the quality of the team is so much better that if I can impress that team, they're then going to recommend me to um, other projects. And we've seen that happen over and over and over where um, the folks we work with just want somebody who's a skillful listener, a critical thinker, and is able to respond. I mean, these are all the basics, very, very basic. But we just we try to hit those basics out of the park, and um, and I don't see that in any way being attached to a particular typology. And what does that reduced scope of work look like? What is it when you say there's a reduced scope of work with that sort of collaborative team model? What what does that mean? Yeah. Can you explain that to me a little so, bit more? Cool. Yeah, I'm glad you asked because I feel like this is very relevant for a for a young office, right? Someone get coming out of school these days, they're going to have capacity in terms of rendering. They're going to have capacity in terms of 3D modeling. They're going to have capacity in terms of producing presentations, right? These are all just kind of these tertiary skill sets that you have to have coming out of architecture school. So we were able to leverage those just to get our foot in the door on these larger teams, larger projects. There might have been a several designers already on board, but we were now the voice in the room as well. And so that was our open door to suddenly impress a larger audience. And after that, so, so to answer your question directly, these are 3D services. These are um, landscape design, furniture design, um, small mock-ups, um, basically taking a very small portion of a larger design project and saying, we're going to pour a lot of love and energy into this. And that for us has been the front door to a much, um, a network of consultants and clients at a higher caliber. Great. Well, thanks, Anthony, for answering that question just in terms of both the strategic part of it, which is uh, talking about how you're getting your foot in the door and you're building that trust, and then also the tactical part, which would be, hey, this is exactly what we're doing. We're doing some 3D stuff, the 3D models, we're doing some renderings. So that's I'm glad that other people out there can, can hear that. Um, so, so far we talked about, uh, you've mentioned kind of two strategies that have helped you out in the early days. The first one was negotiating a contract with your previous employer that allowed you to gracefully and, and, you know, very nicely exit out of the firm while still providing them value and getting that cash flow for yourself and your firm. And then also not being above helping out on ancillary type or tertiary type of uh, services with other contracts. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what other, during those first, I think those are two great strategies that can help people think about, man, how do I make this happen? 
recently yeah. I was I was talking with uh, another architect. The interview will probably go live sometime. But he comes from a family of means, and so I just frankly asked him. I said, "How important was it that your family is very wealthy to you being able to start your own firm and and pursue、okay. this kind of high design that he does?" And he was really honest with me. He said, "You know what?" He's all. He just laughed. He said, "Yeah, I was one hundred percent." He's. I don't know if I could do it without having, having those、mm. means. So, the question I'm、mm-hmm. going to throw it back at you. Did you have any means when you started out your your firm, Anthony? No, we did not. <laughs>、um, and we received some criticism from people we love and trust, but、um, but I did have some. We did have a business coach, and we did. A tremendous amount of、um, planning, and so、um, we thought very carefully and intentionally about how to mitigate the risk we were about to assume. And to to put that, what what does that mean? That means we literally wrote a list of everything that could go wrong, and then we wrote a game plan to address each item on that list. And if I had one piece of advice, if someone were to come to me and say, "How did you write your business plan?" I would say, "Well." I can show you that, but the number one thing that we did was write a list of all that can go wrong, and then write a game plan for each list. It was an exhaustive exercise, but it was so helpful. And finances was one of the things we addressed, of course. Do you remember anything on that list having happened? Yeah,、um, it it all has.、Um, <laughs> yeah. <It all> has. <laughs> Yeah, it.、Uh, believe me, um, every. Um, I feel like we've, you know, we've been given quite the education in the last eighteen months.、Um, let me let me think of a good example.、Um, some、uh, the things that come to mind, Enoch, are are the solutions. So maybe I could work backwards from that.、Um, so to make the jump from the number of projects that we were able to handle. To growing beyond that,、um, one of the solutions was working with、um, folks who would be open to being independent contractors. And so, if I were one of the problems or one of the risks, then we would have written down was how do we grow to a point where we can bring on folks full time. And so, one of the ways to mitigate that risk was to have this intermediate step of、um, teammates and collaborators. Who we're kind of the client, not the boss, and、um, and we we probably had twenty of these things that we we tried to flush out. And so, what was the actual line item? Do you remember the line item on your list that dealt with that? What was the thing that could go wrong? Was it just trying trying to scale, trying to find people, having too much work? Yeah, yeah. So、um, I'm sure any business owner, especially in the professional services world, is familiar with. The kind of the ebb and flow of when it rains it pours, and then、uh, I think we're in that right now. I think a lot of design professionals are in high demand, and that's certainly been a blessing to help launch us. And so,、um, the we haven't、um, we've worked we we didn't just jump out of our our employment, and so that amount of overlap was was fairly difficult to handle.、Um, I felt like I was doing two full-time jobs at the same time, but what that did was it made it so that I was never desperate. I never had to feel like I had to take a job. We could really listen to our intuition in terms of asking truly, does this project match what we believe in? Does it match our values? Because when you work two full-time jobs,、um, cash flow is at least decent, and then you're you, you don't feel obligated to. Um, to make concessions and and to make compromises when you're really just laying a foundation for your firm,、um, so、um, what was the line item? It was it had to do with how do we scale and how to do that intelligently without assuming、um, too much risk. Is it hard to say no to projects? Is it hard to say no to projects? I think. My wife and I both have the personality that struggle with that, but we have a、uh, a criteria for projects that helps alleviate maybe the anxiety that it would cause for me to have to say.、No. And so,、um, I when I do say no, I don't make these folks feel unimportant. I just help them understand how 
um, there's somebody better for them um, to help with their project. Could you tell us about the criteria that you've used? Yeah, yeah. So um, one of the criteria we use is hyper-local. When I graduated from school, I could have never imagined, like many of the precedents we would study and admire truly were works of international architecture. And I never, I just assumed that architecture was not regional and that my practice one day would certainly not be bound by any affiliation to a city or a town. And um, when I entered, when I became a professional, I began to realize the incredible strength and advantage, almost the X factor that a, like a hyper local firm can have. Um, there is, there's almost like a snowball momentum that comes from impressing a client, treating consultants well, and then them just rubbing shoulders with five more meetings that same day on all their other projects. And so we started by um, not having that requirement on us. We have a project in Cambodia, for example, and we just thought we would keep going like that. Then we realized, oh, wow, we're starting to develop a reputation in Los Angeles. There's an efficiency to being able to reuse um, team teams. And, and then lastly, I feel like we're, we're niching down even further. Um, I grew up in the South Bay, which is uh, just south of LAX. And there is a very strong residential market in this part of town and a growing uh, appreciation of modernism. And I'm, again, finding that um, just to be so close to these projects, to be able to, to say, I've used this consultant on seven projects in the last six months, there is a momentum that builds that is hard to penetrate. And we're, we're really starting to use that as one of our primary criteria. Can we utilize our hyper-local network on this project or not? Um, and so that becomes one, one of the main criteria. And what city are you at specifically? So um, this you won't find this on my website, so <laughs> here's a pro tip. No, I'm in Gardena, which is um, east of Manhattan Beach by about two cities, um, south of LAX. Um, we feel very close to LA, and we've got projects in Santa Monica and on the west side. But um, I, my home and my garage-turned-office is in the city of Gardena. Awesome. So hopefully if you're listening to this podcast, go hop on the video. This is one you're going to want to see. Uh, Anthony has a pretty cool garage office. You know, <laughs> It's not cool. <laughs> yeah, it's cool, man. You think about Hewlett Packard. You always hear about the greats always there start out go. in garages. There you, there you go. So you mentioned that sort of a pro tip. I noticed, I think on your website it says, does it say El Segundo? Uh, it says LA. We've got a mailbox LA. in LA. Um, and it, you know, we don't have a tremendous amount of clients come here. Uh, we're all the time taking our laptops to them, but, um, we do have a, a short term vision to make this place, uh, legitimately cool enough that it would reflect who we are and, and be something that, that folks can come in and really, um, feel service taken care of. Yeah. When you say this place, you mean the garage? The garage. Yes. Okay. Yes. I guess that that could be seen as diminutive saying the garage, but it's also, I, I think it's a compliment, but hey. Well, look, I, again, you won't find that on our website. I, I think um, I, I, I'm a little bit sensitive to whether or not um, we want to totally embrace that brand, but that's the truth. And, and I'm, I'm sharing that with you here. Awesome. Appreciate that. Hey, let's talk about, let's talk about the business coach. Cause I think that's something okay. that could, that could uh, potentially help a lot of people if they kind of embrace that kind of thinking. So first of all, how, how, how helpful was that? 11 out of 10. I mean, it was the most influential thing. Uh, this gentleman has nothing to do with the design or architecture industry, and I think that was an asset. He is simply a man who is interested in business, personally an entrepreneur, lives on the East Coast, and has started several successful companies. So he just has some real world experience. And um, I ha have a certain amount of respect for him so that let's say um, I write my own to-do list. I should write a business plan. There was something about it coming from someone who I didn't want to disappoint when he gave me these exercises 
write a risk mitigation plan, launch a website in 24 hours, um, write your sales cycle. When he would give me these assignments, I didn't want to let him down, right? So I would actually accomplish them and wanted to do it with excellence. And so he would, uh, that re- the relationship was developed um, during the planning stages of, of uh, before we launched. And I meet with him about once, once a month. I buy him dinner. He flies out here. And we just talk for three hours. And my head's always spinning at the end of these meetings. But um, I feel extremely proficient as an as a architectural technician because I've been doing that ever since I was 16 years old. Um, but I needed some wisdom, some aggressive strategy in terms of how to operate a business effectively and profitably, and that was essential. So I don't want to downplay my architectural education or the wealth of knowledge that my employers and mentors have given me, but when I started my company, I needed one more thing, and I found that almost exclusively in this business coach. What was the investment to have those kind of have that kind of mentor. Yeah, so um, I would probably be willing to pay. Um, I would probably be willing to pay um, the highest hourly fee for his time because we had. S- I would get so much value out of emails and phone calls and dinners. Um, in full disclosure, um, he is also a longtime personal friend. And so um, I know he charges other clients. He hasn't charged me. Um, I think that's because he finds a lot of personal joy out of seeing our success. And um, I'm, I know one day I, I hope to repay him in ways other than friendship. But um, it was certainly worth an investment, but I, I did not have to incur that cost. Well, that is, that's wonderful. Excellent resource. And just to give our listeners an idea, uh, is this gentleman, is he a professional business coach? Is that what he does exclusively he or he kind of does that on the side? He does that on the side, yeah. Okay. So based upon your knowledge of business coaches in general, you know, what would he charge other clients or what could someone expect to pay for a good coach? You know, I'd be guessing, you know, like I haven't, I haven't di- you know, I haven't kind of uh, done that research myself. Um, but I did read the, the email that you sent out about, um, Art Gensler's recommendation about paying for it, even if you can't afford it. And I, I would, as silly as it sounds, I mean, we are very bootstrap oriented. We did not buy software until we had billed the client. We are very much very frugal, but this is one area where, um, I would, I would splurge and I'm not exaggerating. Um, I can't give you the cost, but I, all I can say is the value is very high. I, I would agree with that, absolutely. So t- t- tell us a little bit about the things that, that your coach, and what, what's his name, by the way? His name is Darren. Okay. So what has Darren had you do? Give me an insight about, you say this is really valuable. How Help mm-hmm. us understand how it was so valuable to it, what you got out of this and the breakthroughs you had. Take us through the process. Yeah. So... Um, Okay, maybe three things come to mind. I'll rattle them off and we can go into them if you want. Um, one was giving me exercises and assignments that I'd actually do, okay? Um, like write this business plan, things like that. Uh, the second would be um, critiquing the assumptions that I had based upon the firms that I had worked with. So basically putting on paper how did this company or what is your assumption about how this part of the business works and then critiquing that and figuring out if that was truly optimized or not Um, and then the last part was being a sounding board for developing a crystal clear vision for what we were shooting for Um, so I think just off the top of my head those were the three main um, kind of items we would discuss, and and I guess we can dive into any one of those if you'd like. Oh, that'd be great. I think that'd be really useful. Let's talk about the exercises. What kind of exercises did Darren have you do? Uh, so, um, the one that comes to mind is um, assemble, like chart out your sales cycle, meaning list every step that happens between 
uh, somebody calling you or sending you an email and the execution of the contract. And I know there's this is a topic you've covered many, many times. Um, so it was that means that I sit down at my computer, I write a list of bullet points. I'm myself surprised to see, oh wow, there's a lot of bullet points on here. Um, and then him and I would sit down together and basically organize them into groups and figure out, okay, what would bring tremendous amount of value? What is the client's perspective at this point? And I've had tremendous feedback from my clients and even prospective clients where they say, wow, we're comparing you to other offices and your proposal is so crystal clear. Well, that's because I thought a proposal was an agreement and we decided to spend half a day designing the most beautiful one-page document you've ever seen and that came out, that was the deliverable that came out of the exercise of starting with what is your sales cycle. So it went from kind of a question to a list of bullet points to an, kind of an analysis that says what's good, what's bad about this. Ultimately, we discovered we need some deliverables, some, um, we need something that you can print and touch and hold to help bring some clarity to this process. So how does your proposal differ from what you would have done otherwise? I would have just sent um, my agreement that is seven pages long, not pretty, and doesn't reflect the values of the client. We still do that. That's still part of the process. And I incentivize it by being very clear as I'm giving you this. I'm going to save your project slot after I receive this. It's, it's very clear. But when we're coming out of the gate, meeting somebody who just has a vision, just has a dream, they want to know, A, am I excited about it? Do I agree with it? Um, what, what, why would I take it? Those are things that an architectural agreement is not going to address, right? And then on top of that, they want to know, can they afford us? What does that process look like? And so that's where we thought, wow, these are super important things to these people and we're not addressing them. Let's put on our design creative cap and figure out if we can solve that problem. And, um, and so Darren just has a, a knack for identifying the problems that he wants us as creative thinkers to address. And those were the ones that I initially was overlooking just because I, I think I'm a good CAD technician and I just didn't have experience in that department. Do you have a sample of that proposal you could provide for some of our listeners that might be interested in seeing that? You know what? I could probably put together um, like kind of like the template version of it. Um, it's, it's very simple, um, almost embarrassingly simple. But once I've been using it, it clicked. It's got our, our logo at the top my description of the project in very um, exciting terms like what I find is 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 um, the core of what gets me excited about the project and then it says in super simple terms with a beautiful font what the cost is and what the workflow for us would look like um, so very simple and and I know it sounds like extremely rudimentary but I wasn't using it and anyone can implement it Awesome. What else in the sales cycle do you think is significant going through that exercise that you think mm -hmm. people might not know about if they're starting out? Yes. Okay. Here's a good one. Um, I, again, this is so simple. It's almost embarrassing to confess, but um, I had to learn how to make it clear in a polite way that I was being considered and I'm also considering the client. This is a, a two way consideration. And that, because I want to just make everyone happy. I never really knew how to do that. And I never really knew I had to do that. I, I kind of assumed they were interviewing me and if they accept my price, I have to say yes. Okay. And as the market started to lift, as our reputation started to become stronger, that was a problem. And so now we are very tactful in the way that we say, hey, you're interviewing us. You see value in connecting with the right designer we have the privilege of being able to be selective with our clients as well. And so um, this is going to be uh, an interview process in both ways where we feel we can try to figure out if it's a true win-win. And I feel like, um, again, that's super simple, but there's a specific point in our sales cycle early on where we get to have that conversation and let them know that 
we're considering them as much as they're considering us. Excellent. Thanks for giving that example so it can bring people home so they know how that conversation happens. Found that mm -hmm. to be so important. Anything else in mm -hmm. terms of the sales? The sales of the Anything sales else process? In terms of sales. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I also find that um, being flexible in the way that we define our services has been an advantage that a young or small firm can take advantage of. We are very nimble. And so, um, although we do use templated agreements, we try very hard not to fall into the rut of, well, this is the way we do it. I feel like we have to leverage being nimble in order to be competitive. And so, let's say our price is, there's a little bit of sticker shock, right? Let's say that occurs. That doesn't mean that we can't say, well, let's, let's discuss the price that you were hoping, and then let's reverse engineer the services that could fit that. And we do that all the time. So here's a goofy little pro tip. We will often give our price before flushing out every detail of the service so that um, we have that high-level price conversation, and then we kind of work backwards from that based upon the outcome of that high-level price conversation. So we can really do our best to make it work. And I feel like I'm operating my client's best interest when I um, tailor my services, sometimes scaling up, sometimes scaling down, in order to fit what they want, as opposed to just saying, it's so arbitrary to me to say, Anthony's more or less expensive than someone else. Well, what does that mean? What are the services behind that? And so we usually try to draw out that process over several conversations so that we could truly understand the level of services that are going to kind of serve them best. Since you brought up fees, would you say that you're on, on the high side, the middle ground, or the low ground in your general area and the kind of architecture you practice? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Great question. I'm becoming more and more familiar with what is industry standard, and the spectrum is mind-boggling. You can find, but it all depends on what, what they're searching for. So, um, can, we, can we dig into we, that a little bit? Sure. Sure. There are um, draftsmen who, and this, th this goes for architectural designers, goes, goes for consultant structural engineers, um, who are very efficient. I could never compete with them. They, I have tremendous respect for them in terms of um, how quickly they can procure a permit, right? Um, and, and I often enjoy teaming up with somebody like that because they bring a skill set and a degree of experience. They also are at the low end of, of cost, okay? Then there are And the in your area, what is that, that just for a benchmark? How are these guys charging how do just I answer figures? That? Uh, just in terms of figures, are they charging a square foot? I mean, just to give our listeners an idea of what we're talking about here. This is LA, not applicable everywhere, but... Yeah, yeah, they, they would be charging um, a, a, a single digit number per square foot. Um, even in that, there's a tremendous amount of range. And when we're talking about projects, there's a big difference between a master bedroom you know, addition versus a new home. Um, but they would charge per square foot, or they would just have like a, a big house, small house fee, um, or a big remodel, small remodel fee. And um, I'm sure that they're, they just have a calculation in terms of what, how many hours they put into the project, um, but it is a fixed fee. Mm -hmm. Okay. So within that, within the single digits, obviously there's, there's two or $3 a square foot and then there's eight or $9 a square foot. Where's the kind of the range that you would say is the lower end where you're at? Yeah. Let me just do a quick calculation. Um, let's see. Thanks for letting me put you on the spot here. Yeah, you are putting me on the spot. I would say the, um, it can be under five bucks, uh, often. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. And then the middle range? So I think we fall into the middle range. Okay. Um, we're, we're, we're more than that, but less than the offices that have a deep portfolio and celebrity clients. I, my attempt, though, and I know people are going to roll their eyes at this, my attempt is to provide that level of service in terms of amount of drawings, 
um, amount of 3D iterations, the amount of kind of personal connection. So to kind of draw on my experience with those very high world-class residential designers, but bring it down to where these are dudes operating out of the garage, they're hungry, they work very, very hard, and so we fall in the middle range. So I truly believe that I'm bringing a tremendous amount of value for that client, um, and I'm upfront about the experience I do and don't have. But we've brought a lot of smiles to people's face by um, giving them what they would consider the high-end design experience at about a middle-of-the-road price. And what would be the high-end price in your, oh if you had to goodness. generalize? Uh, 15, what are we talking? 15 to 20% of construction. Co- I would say 15% of construction cost. And does that yeah. include, does that include the consultants, consultant fees? Mm-hmm. Um, the, the ones that are absorbed by the architect does not include interior designer, right. but would include structural. Structural. Okay. Are you guys finding, just out of curiosity, are you guys finding working with, uh, having to work with MEP consultants or you guys do that all in-house? Uh, we do, no, if, if the project re- would require an MEP a consultant, it would either be client provided or we would use a consultant and they would contract directly with the owner, but we would manage their deliverable. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thanks for going down the rabbit hole of fees with me there helps people understand sort of your, the way you've approached, you know, how you structure your fees. And that's a wrap for another show about the business of architecture. To get more resources about how you as an architect can run a rewarding business that is both fun, flexible, and profitable, visit businessofarchitecture.com and click the join button to claim your free account to Business of Architecture Insider. As a member, you'll have access to free tools and resources to help you get more clients, start a new firm, and much more. You'll also get access to my book, Social Media for Architects, where you'll learn how to use internet tools for fun and for profit. Until next week, this has been The Business of Architecture. Views expressed on the show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment, except to help you conquer the world. Bump music credit to Ben Folds 5, Do It Anyway.